Yeah, I, I had worked with uh, Jane and the people who were making the, the thyroid. At that t point in time, the surge arresters consisted of the thyroid as the energy absorbing media in there. But they also had series gaps in it. Right. Because if you put the thyroid directly on the line and started conducting, basically you had no way of clearing it, as they say. The follow current could be tremendous. Yeah. So that, that was where you had series gaps where you would basically the, the gap voltage would go down to very nearly zero. You'd absorb the energy in the uh, thyroid. Then when it cleared on the, uh, on the passing through zero on the uh, AC cycle, then it was ready for it to go for another one. But you had to have the gaps in there. And the gaps kept getting more and more complicated in structure in terms of taking over part of the job of limiting the current so that you didn't over, over, rate, over uh, drive the thyroid. And the, the surge arresters for 100 kV, 300 kV, and higher were extremely complicated in their gap structures. And some of them, they had to be used on AC but couldn't be used on DC. Right. They, they had another whole problem in terms of how you get these things to work on DC, and that had to do with the, basically the LC properties of the line that you had. You, yeah. If you clamped, you depended on having a little bit of a, a, a transient in there that would help to clear it. By itself, but that, yeah, that, whole, clear. that whole industry, I think, is committed to the to the barrister. Yes, the the thing that the barrister brought to them was the ability to make station arresters with either no gap or very simple gaps. Yeah. And it was actually the the first exposure that I had to thyroid, where they wanted to know how does thyroid work because they wanted to improve on it. And we went through some of these in terms of even making just single point contacts with the silicon carbide, get some silicon carbide single crystals and make uh, point contacts. Didn't learn an awful lot from that. But then when the zinc oxide varistors came in, we had those from Matsusha, I said, ah, oh, these could possibly be an application there, but you have to make something which is a little bit larger. So once we actually had a composition in-house where we could start making these, I made up some that were about two or two inches in diameter, about an inch thick. And they sent them over to Gene and says, here's something that I'd like to have you test because they, they had the only test equipment really in the world where you could do that. And I didn't hear anything from them for probably five or six months. Then I get this phone call and Gene's on the phone. He says, Bill, what is that and where did you get it? Yeah. He says, we're very interested. <laughs> now, was it your mix pretty much that yes. they adopted? Yes. Well, that's, that's interesting. The, 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 the whole uh, the, the composition, the materials that go to make this up, it's basically zinc oxide. Then there's, uh, at that point in time, there's about a half a dozen key additives at about a half a percent level. Not really very much, but more than what you normally consider for doping semiconductors. And <clears throat> what we'd found was, yeah, you could vary the composition and you could vary the voltage on them. If you wanted to scale voltage, you could make the whole thing thicker. That would get you to a higher voltage. Uh, but the discovery that I made was that if you start looking at the microstructure in here, you found that different compositions had different grain sizes, and the different uh, grain size mixtures had different voltages per millimeter, and you could control that by controlling the grain size. And then from that, we sort of backed out that, well, okay, now maybe we've got a mechanism for how these things work. And you calculate that the number of grains that you might have in series from one electrode to the other, it turns out it's about two volts per grain. Is it tunneling? Well, it, 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 the, the volts per grain is not really the right terminology. It's the volts per grain boundary because the grains themselves are doped zinc oxide, highly conductive. And there's no way that you'd get two volts across an individual grain. But at, right at the boundaries, we subsequently found that those were Schottky barriers and you can measure the capacitance voltage characteristics of them. They looked exactly like a Schottky barrier, and this was tunneling through the Schottky barrier that was giving you the high degree of nonlinearity. Now, the lollipop ones <coughs> took off first. Right. And this says September 1979, which is probably three years after they started production in Ireland, and by that time they'd made over 100 million of these lollipops. Right. The figure today of world production of these is, is, 
It's you know, probably at least as many as the hamburgers that McDonald's have sold. Yeah, you know, it, it, it just, one goes with every computer as a minimum requirement. And um, <clears throat> the other thing that we rather much missed out on as a company, we did have an opportunity to get some GE products with the surge protection in them so the user could plug it in for his computer. Right. And this is a nice one that the uh, bus made, which gives you a telltale light and also a fuse. Yes. So you've got everything in one, one spot. Yeah. This happens to be a, a five amp, but you can change the fuses from um, two amps to I think eight amps. And then of course the big strip market completely eluded GE. Now, now I think now they, they sort of come back in with the uh, sourcing overseas with yep. the, some of them. Now <coughs> all of this discussion about this protection is quite different than what people may recognize as a RFI line filter. In fact, in some cases, a filter may contribute to the surge problem as much as uh, anything else because of the inductance uh, that's involved with it. Right, it gives you the circuit diagram right on there, and it, right. yeah, it's, it's, it's an RLC circuit, mm -hmm which if you hit it with the right frequency... Some electronics gonna... needs that, but it does not preclude having to have good surge protection. Now, uh, at that time we were... Was Art Bika the boss at that time yet? Yes, yeah. I remember the, uh, one 65. of the... 65. Uh, 65 was when I came to the center and it was... Yeah, and it was about 1970, 71, 72 when we were actively involved with it. And I think it was about 72 that uh, GE was setting up the powder processing facility and the pilot line in Syracuse. Yeah. And that's when the first things r really started coming off the line. And but well, one of the people we should mention here, I think, is uh, Francois Martzloff, because he was really key to a lot of things. He knew and he understood yeah. transients. He, he took and over it, from uh, Chowdhury. Yes. Chowdhury went to Locomotive and mm -hmm. Francois had been a fuse man down in Philadelphia. Yeah. And he came up and, uh, as I referred earlier, he was the first to get the st statistical base. Right. I'll give you another example. Uh, when they brought out the, the uh, electric toothbrush, there's a, a, a little transformer to charge it and a diode. Right. And those things were failing all over the, the, the country. And they couldn't understand w why this was happening. They had 300 volt diode, which is presumably good enough. But the, what they forgot was that a transformer for transients is almost one to one due to the capacitance. Yes. And, right the and, and those simple things, which are engineering details, are not taught in schools. So they kept raising the, the uh, level of uh, uh, diodes and, and winding the transformer so they would cut the capacitance down. And so much of the stuff that we see when we've been in the product kind of uh, uh, end of it are just these purchasing pressures to get the cost down, mm -hmm. get the cost down. Well, I think sometimes first you need to worry about talking to people that have been in, a, in the realm of this sort of thing and see if you've got a chance of, of uh, having, you always have failures. Yes. And with electronic stuff, you particularly have what we call early, early failures. Yeah. Once you get those weeded out, 
I've got SCRs that have been running for 55 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're extremely reliable, but you have to still have the protection to right. go with them. One of the things I learned from Francois Martzloff and really admired him for, he was, uh, I guess you might call old school engineer, uh, which says, build it and break it. And he was very much in favor of, okay, you've got this thing which operates. What happens when it fails? Yes. Everything has a failure point. Yes. So you keep upping the voltage, you up the current, you up the temperature, you do it. How does it fail? And we learned an awful lot about failure mechanisms on these. And you mentioned uh, this one having a fuse in there. A barrister by itself can fail open or can fail closed. If it fails open, you don't have any protection. That's if it fails closed, it's putting a short onto your line, and you can preclude that by putting in a fuse. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's why a lot uh, of these have a combination of a varistor plus a fuse. And when the fuse blows, it says, well, OK, your varistor probably did its job. It, it saved your components. And uh, we have recently seen a paper published about that where if you make large ones and can afford them, in an industrial application anyway, it's better than putting a a cluster together with, with the fuses. Yeah, that's, that's right. Now, um, I've been out of touch with Francois for some time, but he, of course, left um, and went to uh, uh, Gatorsburg. Yes, the yeah, he, was in the, he was down there with uh, NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology, yeah, and continued to do a lot of work on lightning, lightning suppression, yeah. understanding what um, transients were. In 1984, a bunch of us got the Dushman Award, which is not anything super special. But what surprised me when we went there, um, when, when did Lionel Levinson, uh, did he start, my recollection is he started a little later on. Uh, yeah, I had been working on this for probably about a year, maybe a year and a half, and Lionel Levinson, uh, Herb Phillip, and Joe Long, uh, yeah, two I other know, names I on there, Herb. came in all, about all at the same time. Lionel and uh, Herb were basically physicists, and Joe Long was much more of a materials guy and in inorganic materials, so he was very much interested in the microstructure and what was going on inside of him, as was I. Now, do, do you know anything about Joe Wong? Because he left fairly early. Yeah, the last, when, when he left here, he went to uh, Lawrence Livermore. And, and uh, he was not doing any work in transients at that point. He, he was often something else on uh, inorganic chemistry. I, I, had I met him once out there. Some considerable regard for Joe because he, uh, he seemed to want to get something done. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, he, and uh, was pretty well acclimated. One night, nine o'clock at night, uh, I was in a laboratory and, and Roy Apker called me. This is a little hard to put in perspective for people who don't, don't know the individuals involved, but Roy had been in the semiconductor work all of his life at the laboratory working for Malcolm Hebb and uh, he said, you know, this uh, Verister thing looks like it's a real winner. And I said, well, um, it's part of the system and it's needed, but we've got to do more in silicon than we've been doing as a company. The end result of all of this is a, a rather sad commentary and that is that uh, Jack Welch was not a strong uh, proponent of component manufacturing. Yes. Um, if he couldn't pour it in a tank truck uh, and, and haul it off, he, he didn't see the connection. But uh, every computer has got to have these things in it. Mm -hmm. And you may make the money on one part of it or the other part, but it has to be at this state of uh, system engineering. 
Oh, and a marvelous work that's been done by Intel. Uh, a, a comment on uh, Jack Welch. One of the things that he said very soon after he uh, took over as CEO was he wanted us to be number one or number two in the business. Yeah. And he looked at and he put additional investment into GE semiconductor products for several years. But they were never really number one or number two. They were always down about number five or number six. Well, they bought Intercell. And they yeah, sold they bought Intercell, Intercell and then they, they sold. They, yeah. they bought Analog. But, but, but here's, here's one of the curious things. The GMO Barrister business was number one. There is nobody touching us in this country well, or in the world. Maybe you thought there were at least 400 people employed. I, that, that was a rough guess that I think we might have had 400 at one time. But it was part of semiconductor products. Basically, when he signed the deal with Harris, the oh, GMO Barrister went with them. You know, J Jack Welch uh, insisted that businesses be number one or number two. He, he wasn't interested in playing in the, in the bottom parts of the market because he says you're always playing catch up. He says your margins are going to be down, your profits are going to be down. And he supported GE Semiconductor for several years. That They went through integrated circuit manufacturing in Syracuse. The Ali Wynn was head of that. And it looked like several times that they were they were probably going to make it. Bought Intercell. Yeah, they bought Intercell, and they had a lot of things going for them, but they still didn't seem to be able to climb up out of it. And finally he said, well, okay, we've, we've done as much as we can. And he found a uh, willing buyer in the uh, form of Harris, and he sold everything to it. And the sad part to me was that the GMOV barrister business, which was part of that, had made money, was number one all the way along, good healthy margins, was not separated out of and, that. And was sold by so many with. departments. Right, right. But I guess maybe that was part of, the, part of the deal was Harris didn't want the parts of GE Semiconductor that weren't making money, but they did want the parts that were. I had a letter from uh, uh, Nick Holniak, and uh, he reviews some of the absolute uh, superiority at the beginning in the, in the 40s, the late 40s, yeah. to where, where there, was there was no, no support. support. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, thank you so much for <laughs> John, it's helping been, it's us. Been, it's and, been uh, great. Good luck to you. You're yeah. a valuable <laughs> man. Okay. And we, we made something out of nothing. <laughs> Right. And, and, uh, yeah, just, just, just a closing statement. The thing that I remember most about this is the people, the individuals. No. It was the right product at the right time. We found a receptive department. We found very enterprising individuals. And you and uh, Francois Martzloff and I and Ken Benson and Dick Schlauterbeck and Gene Saxog and Pittsfield were all the right people in the right place at the right time that made this go. And it worked. It, it worked and it's still working today. <laughs>